hopefully it all went well. Well, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. We've had some really fantastic talks this morning, I think. Um, I would like to talk to you about green chemistry and transforming to clean manufacturing. And I'm going to I'm going to begin in a very unusual way. Um, the Mellon Institute is just up the street from Central Catholic High School, and my son went there. My daughter went to Oakland, uh, uh, Oakland Catholic High School for girls. Um, and every year they've asked me over to give a talk about to the students about sustainability, and particularly in translating that. Uh, for a Catholic, for a Catholic school. So I'm actually going to do the unusual thing. I've not done this in a public audience before outside the school. I'm beginning with that sort of introduction. So the question is, why does Pennsylvania need clean manufacturing? And the answer is, to me is very simple. This is why we need uh, clean manufacturing. This is my granddaughter. It's about the, it's about the children, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, etc. And from a perspective of a Catholic high school, uh, the mother and baby issue is sort of, uh, sort of the center of the, everything that is, that is beautiful about human life, if you think about it. And so we have, we have the parents with this wonderful new creation. And we have the grandparents that are standing by admiring and loving this wonderful new creation. And if the grandparents live, they'll live to see their, their grandchildren. Most of us do. That's a wonderful thing. And some of them will live to see the, the children of, the, of this uh, child and might get to see their great-grandchildren. And of course, this is in Christian, Christian thinking. The, the mother and child thing is just so essential to everything, right? Now, the problem with the way we think that has so much to do with sustainability goes as follows. That eventually, these guys, this is me and my wife right now, are going to pass away. <laughs> and when we pass away, we're going to go and hopefully meet this guy and have some fun with him. But our thinking about the human journey stops uh, with the Grim Reaper. We don't think beyond that. We think about people that we meet and about behaving well towards people, that we're loving people that we meet. We do not think about people that we do not meet. And all of our ethics have been so constituted that they, they have very short range reach in time and space. You have to meet somebody to apply the Ten Commandments, really. And the problem is, we, we can go through life thinking we're really, really good people and doing everything just right, but we can be doing things that are completely messing it up for the people that we won't meet. So there are going to be, hopefully, other generations of human beings. And this is going to go on and on, hopefully, because that's really success for us now, the continuation of our race and of all the things on this beautiful planet that are so critical. Um, and it has to be that this guy wants us to look up. It has to be. So sustainability is all about building an intimacy for the future and the present at the deep core of each human being. We don't have that. We don't know how to do that. We need to learn to know how to do that, to, to worry about the great, 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 great grandchildren that will never be and their welfare. And the reason is that we have the power now to mess it up. Building this intimacy is clearly a job for Christians and for all peoples. This is what our race has to do, because we've crowded out this planet, and the powers that science and technology have given us bring an enormous pressure on this planet. So now let's look at this from another perspective. Why does Pennsylvania need clean manufacturing? It needs it to look after this. Now remember, we'll get rid of the, all the things that I just written. That's the ecosphere. But actually, people don't often think of this. They think about planet Earth. But the ecosphere is a tiny skin, a few miles thick, at the surface of the planet. And everything, all life, everything that's beautiful, precious, and wonderful, is in this gossamer-thin skin on the Earth's surface. It is very vulnerable. 
it is very vulnerable to our power because of science and technology. <coughs> so the powers that science and technology have given us make us all custodians of all life. We're not only talking about advancing our own race to a good future, we're talking about the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and on and on it goes. We're talking about everything now. All right, so in this ecosphere, in this thin gossamer layer over the surface of the planet, we build an economy. And inside this economy, what happens? Well, you can't run it without uh, bringing matter in from the ecosphere to the economy. And the two big things that count are two for sustainability with chemicals, and actually with most things, two critical things that count. There is energy and there is toxics, and we'll talk about those. And so with the economy, you have to bring matter in where you transport. So for example, we mine and refine oil. Um, and it's very important to understand when you're thinking about the big picture of sustainability, to understand the scope of things. So for example, with, ev with every technology there's a risk, and the risk is a function of the inherent hazard and the exposure. So you can have a small hazard and a small exposure, no problem. You can have a small hazard and a big exposure, problem. You can have a big hazard and there's always a problem, small exposure or not. And you can see this very clearly. In the carbon mining and refining that we do, we bring in 10 gigatons of carbon into the economy every year. There is absolutely nothing else we do that is even remotely on that scale. We don't make a gigaton of polymers. That's the, big, the biggest sort of thing that we make. So the carbon, the energy technology, is the absolute critical thing to get right for a sustainable future. Well, we can also bring in uranium, and we mine about 60 kilotons a year, and that's nothing, except it's so hazardous that we can really mess things up. And let me tell you, Fukushima is not over. Fukushima is incredibly dangerous. They have not got it under control, and it still has the capacity to poison the entire Pacific Ocean and the rest of the oceans. So these are the things we worry about. Now, once we bring this stuff into the economy, we process it, in, with inventions largely made by chemists. Mostly it's chemists, people like me. And we create <coughs> molecules, and we're really good at it. And in actual fact, we cannot have the model that we currently have with large numbers of people living in cities without the chemicals. Because the bugs look on us as food, and they'll, they'll colour so quickly you wouldn't believe it without the antibiotics and the, and the other things that we have. But what chemists haven't done enough, and this is where the Institute for Green Science that I direct, direct, direct worries so much, is that we need to do a much better understand how the molecules impact the ecosphere. They're completely new creations that nature has never seen before, and it turns out, while they give us all sorts of benefits, there's often a really sharp downside. We need to understand that. And so, when you're doing science or when you're building an economy, really should focus on the big things. And the big things of chemical toxicity are anything to do with understanding the toxicity, designing non-toxic products that can really replace toxic product, uh, products, or designing ways to lessen the impacts of toxic products. That's what chemists are doing inside the economy. Now, after this material's come in and been used up, its economic value has been extracted, uh, we have large amounts of matter going back to the ecosphere. And our sustainability problems are engaged with all three places. This arrow in particular is extremely threatening. So again, quantity and hazard. The two big problems are, at the big quantity, the CO2 output. 40, for almost 40 billion tonnes of CO2 put out a year. The impact of 40 billion tonnes a year on our gossamer thin atmosphere is enormous. Absolutely enormous. And we could talk about that for hours, but we won't. It's enormous. The other is trace micropollutants. Things, for example, present in water in parts per trillion. So much so that you'd have to take a lake, take all the water away, and you'd have trouble almost seeing the quantity of the material that's in the lake that's causing problem, problems in that lake for the ecosphere. 
So we worry about these things as well. Now it turns out, if we do go solar, and isn't it this morning inspiring? <laughs> we really can, if we can do this. Um, what you do is you move the matter transformations off-site, 92 million miles away. You have furious nuclear chemistry going on in the sun. We simply get the benefit of an infinitesimal amount of that radiant energy. We don't have to pay any of the hour of penalties because they're going on in the sun. That's the first big thing to understand. We can have energy that does not seriously impact the FSC. And so it gets rid of those problems. And then this, the other, how do we handle this, this one? This is a really biggie. It's where my group is, work, work, spends most of its time. And we pre prefer to see ourselves as molecule destroyers, rather. We make, we make molecules to destroy other molecules. This is a very new thing. Chemists have not thought about destroying their creations. They've thought about making their creations. But in actual fact, if their creations are getting into the water and causing all this trouble, and we can't really do without some of them, then you need ways to destroy them before they cause the trouble. This economy thing with globalization is growing horrifically. And we all know that it's the number of planets people keep saying that if we get the whole popu population up to an American standard of living, it's four, five, or six planets worth of stuff. It's clearly not very workable. All right, so Pennsylvania should focus on the big business of big sustainability problems. And you have heard this morning about big business. Solar is big business. It's so good. It was, it was murder watching gas take off here in Pittsburgh and seeing all my, my uh, brilliant environmental friends uh, um, had seen their see the hearts being broken by the fact that even our administrators at Carnegie Mellon, for example, pushing the gas there, because you know that the future of that, there is no good future in that. And now that we've seen a lot of it, are you really that well off for the gas and, and out here in the hills that we see as we drive by? Are you really that well off? Consider instead that it would, would be a solar thing and we'd be using some of our fossil energy to have the plants here to build the things that you need and think of all the jobs that you've heard. That's such a much better direction, isn't it? At least I, at least I think so. Mm -hmm. All right, so whenever you have a chemical technology, you have performances, right? What are these? Well, first of all, there's technical performance. If a, if a, if a chemical doesn't do a transformation well, if it doesn't give you high yields, or it, if, if, if a drug doesn't work, you're not interested in it. Technical performance is great. The second thing is economic performance. So somebody can't make a lot of money out of it, it's not going to happen. All right? Now it turns out that if we look at the chemistry the way we know it, really started in 1856 with an invention by a 17-year-old, the first commercial dye. And in the interim period of a bit over 150 years, the model for um, uh, commercial chemical technologies in that you get these two going well, you've got a technology. The problem is we now recognize that there is a health performance associated with every molecule we make. There is an environmental performance associated with every molecule we make. And there is also a fairness um, performance because it turns out you can make chemicals that are, can only be um, advance the life of very rich people and not everybody else. And that sets you up for an elitism that again does not really work in the long term. So all of these things did need to be uh, thought about. And if I look at chemistry as it currently stands and gaze at it and think about, I guess what the average performance priority is that's embedded in most existing, and we'll take drugs out because they are looked at fairly seriously for health performance, not for environmental, but for health. Um, it's something like this. It's nearly all economic and technical performance. There's a slither of health and there's almost nothing with the environment. We really don't ask the question, is this molecule that I've made that does this wonderful thing that can make me money going to hurt the environment? We, we never ask it. What we need is we need something quite different for sustainability. The performance prioritization should be roughly equal. You have to have, have good technical performance, you have to have good economic performance, but if it's going to work out in that line of our race, for the great-great-grandchildren, if it's going to work, it also has to have high health environmental and fairness performances. 
And so the catalysts that I'm talking to you about have really been, the, these are the molecules we made, have really been developed within the intellectual construct through for, for over for a long time now, but particularly the last 20 years. How do you do this? How do you make chemicals that give you a picture that looks something like that? And it's an incredibly exciting thing to do academically because it takes you into all sorts of multidisciplinary regimes that otherwise you would never go. And it turns out those places are just wonderful to, to be partnered with. Okay, so the fundamental challenge is how can we parameterize the health environment and fairness performances of chemical products and processes? Okay. Well, this brings us to green chemistry. Its definition is that it is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. You're designing against hazards. If it's a little hazard, it's not an important problem. If it's a big hazard, it's an important problem. And you are designing, meaning you're thinking a priori, but about how to handle um, the, the hazardous nature of something. And when I think of green chemistry and the problem space, I think of a bookcase. And on the bookcase, we have shelves. There are six of them. And as we build this field, which we are doing, um, we put books that describe the problems and our achievements and why, why this was better than something else that we had. And what you collect on each on the shelves, the different classes of problems, of chemical problems having to do with sustainability. So the bottom shelf is green synthesis. And most of the field is tied up in trying to make molecules with less waste and less toxic stuff going out the other end. Now let me tell you, that might can make you quite a lot of money if you're a chemical company. But as a major impact on sustainability, it's almost nothing. It is not a big problem for sustainability. The second thing is to renewable feedstocks. Now what this means is, if I look around this room, much of the stuff in here comes from oil, transformed by chemists into the product. So the surface of this, the floor, the carpet, that screen, you name it, it comes from oil, all right? We, were, we, we want to get it from recently dead plant matter rather than fossilized plant matter so that we can stop mining and refining and start recycling inside the skin that we've, we've talked about. The next is save energy. That's absolutely critical. We're here to about that. I won't say any more. The next level, and it gets harder to do as you go up because as you go up that ladder, you're getting in the face of people, let me tell you. Um, toxic elements. We have to start mining, refining, <coughs> and distributing toxic elements. The classic is lead paint and lead and gasoline, but we have many of these kinds of problems. We're still suffering, and we're going to have to spend billions to stop the suffering to protect that, that germ line, the kid, great grandkids, in the city of Pittsburgh and pretty much everywhere. Now, I will tell you, I teach this in my class. The reason we have these lead problems comes down to the bad behavior of about five people from 1920s to the 1960s or 70s. About five people. Five leaders that really, really made it impossible for the country to do the right thing. You can do awful damage if you, if you, if you, if you you're purveying toxic products and you refuse to, to do something about it. Use your power to block things being done about it. The next are persistent molecular compounds. We make compounds that may as well be elements. You know, unless an element is radioactive, it's forever. Right? We're making compounds that are so stable that they're almost forever. And they're causing trouble. And so we have to be very careful with this. And finally, it turns out that you might ask yourself as that little baby is forming. How, how does a cell know to go and become a brain cell? How does a cell know to go become, become a bone cell or a neurological cell? And it turns out the cells know because of commands sent to them by hormones. Starting with the mother's hormones, you have the nine hormonal glands of the mother, and eventually the hormones that, that are coming from the babies forming endocrine glands, the endocrine system, which makes hormones and glands, releases the hormones to the blood, 
The blood takes the hormones to the cells. The hormones dock on the outside with the protein. They go inside, they get into the nucleus. They arrive in the nucleus and they arrive at a protein, a receptor protein. It's like a lock and key thing where the hormone goes in, <laughs> blows up my, my, um, my, uh, my um, device, um, and goes in and essentially, I think, I think it still works here, and eventually um, tells, tells the, the cell to read the gene. Read gene. The commands read gene are sent by hormones. Uh, many of the molecules that we have in our 85,000 or so that, that the EPA registry turn out to mimic hormones. They look enough like them that they get in there and they either block the keyhole or they actually turn the key. And, you, and we're having havoc because of this. It turns up in all sorts of things, particularly male reproductive health because it's so easy to study. And so, for example, you had to know the Chinese were in trouble. You had to know. Because they're absolutely useless at looking after their environment. And so about five years ago, uh, 30,000 Chinese sperm donors were assessed. They had height limitations and that sort of thing on being a sperm donor in China. And 55-ish uh, percent of, the, of the, the potential candidates were considered deemed acceptable. Last year they did it, and they had to take all of the constraints off. 17 percent were deemed acceptable. I would say in another five years it's going to be less than 10%. These, the, 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 the reproductive system of both males and females is being hammered by these, uh, this is way too fast to be anything to do with genetics. And in the Chinese case it's happened in a couple of generations. Because they've only really been doing what we do aggressively. But with no, this, is, this is why what's currently going on in Washington with removing the laws that protect the environment are so serious. Yes. All right, so this is a little hazard. This is a reasonable hazard. This is a big hazard. This is a pretty big hazard. This is a really big hazard, and this is a huge hazard. We're focused on, on, on the endocrine disruptors. And, and, all right. and so what is what an endocrine disruptor? This is the definition from the EPA. It's an, it's an exogenous, it's a chemical from outside the body that interferes with the production, release, transport, binding, action, or elimination of natural hormones from the body. The things that control things. Responsible for the maintenance of homeostasis, the fact that I'm standing here at a given temperature, is all hormonally uh, controlled. Um, and the regulation, particularly of developmental processes. So development goes on for about 25 years. Most of it early on, the, 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 the brain of humans not fully developed till about 25. And if you mess up the signals, you change the outcome. And it's almost, or, or I only know about bad news, and I know about a lot. All right, so here's another reason why Pennsylvania uh, should absolutely go green. This is the Susquehanna River, just outside Harrisburg. So Middletown small mouth guide Bob Clouser has for more than a decade sounded the alarm that Susquehanna small mouth and the Harrisburg reaches were disappearing. He watched his guiding business shrink from 75 small mouth per day to five or less. Increasingly he had to inform his customers from as far away as Cleveland, Ohio, don't come, it's not worth fishing. Males of the small mouth fat family, as well as many other species, are feminized by infinitesimal traces of estrogens. Now, you get estrogens in the water when you have a cave, a concentrated animal feeding lot, and you've got all of those female animals going to the bathroom, and they excrete estrogen, and it gets into the water, and, and then the same estrogen tells the, the fish how to develop, and the fish are swimming in it, and literally, parts per trillion or less low, but even less than a part per trillion, will produce these effects on smallmouth bass. But the biggest worry is the reproductive pill. Because in a reproductive pill, you have 10 micrograms of, of um, ethyl estradiol, the active ingredient, 10 millionths of a gram. Woman takes it, full success to her body, you're pregnant, don't, don't ovulate. Um, and then on, on it goes, and you end up um, we made it to be resistant to degradation. You excrete it, and then you get into trouble. And I'm going way too slow for the talk, but that doesn't matter. This, I'll finish on time. 
There, it turns out that there are, um, we had to figure out how to do this. How can you tell whether or not a chemical is an endocrine disruptor? And so what we did, this is a group of people, the leader is Pete Myers here, he's incredible. Um, we put all these guys together, and I, it's like me, I don't take too much credit. I, I, I was a cheerleader more than anything else, but I go up and say, well, you're, Mr., you're Mrs. Pituitary, and you're, you're Mr. Thyroid, and you're Mr. You're Mr. Um, estrogen. What tests do my chemicals have to pass but by, the, but by the assays you've invented to show that they're not endocrine, and their decomposition products show they're not endocrine? By the time you do that a lot, you build a lot of confidence that things are not endocrine disruptors. Now, what about the pill? Are we going to throw it away? It's unlikely, isn't it? So therefore, we had to have a methodology to get rid of it before it gets out into the water. And because so much of it in the United States is, it passes through a treatment plant, if you have a very, it has to be really inexpensive because the volumes are enormous, a really inexpensive technology for getting rid of it, um, you, um, you can um, handle that. So the next part of the talk is really about the technology, but we, we, we've run out of time. Um, uh, what we have is a technology that is cheaper and at least as effective, if not more so, than any other technology for removing trace chemicals that have these very powerful um, endocrine disruption effects on wildlife and in the water. We're in the process of commercializing it. We have a little company. I should show you at least one thing, because this is kind of really nifty. Um, okay, so the kind of things, I use a football for the things that they, that they, that they destroy, but they'll, they'll destroy any dye. And so here's a little picture. This is a bunch of different dyes. Now in China, you've got rivers changing color because the, the dyeing companies just... So, so what happened is, put peroxide, now they're putting the catalyst in, and if you watch, it's pretty much, all dyes will bleach and bleach really very quickly. So I'll move on from there, it's, it's drugs that are a problem, it's explosive residuals, it's disinfectants, phenols, sulfur compounds, uh, hormones, endocrine disruptors, pathogens, it splits water, that's important from a chemistry point of view, and it does that chemistry which chemists really get excited about. And it removes mold stains, so that's what I wanted to show you. Here's our technology invented in Indianapolis based on the catalyst, or the, the, the parent catalyst actually, for getting rid of mold. What, watch it. There's black mold in an attic. Now, as you can see, the mold is disappearing pretty much on contact. And to the contractor, this is a tenth the cost of the next uh, cheapest alternative, which is to take pretty much that solution without the catalyst. And when I say catalyst, we're talking about a few crystals in, for, for, uh, for this house. We're not talking about a pile. We're talking about a compound where you put in a few crystals. And so, what the alternative is, is for his guys to go in and scrub for a couple of days. So he's in and out of jobs in less than two hours, where normally they would be going and scheduling for a couple of days. Um, so that's a kind of a nifty technology. We think, we, we know we can do the same performance that you're seeing there with the trace chemicals that are water. Thank you for your attention. So endocrine disruption is the absolute worst news to ever hit the chemical industries. What, what, you're, what, you're, what, what, what we know with absolute certainty, absolute certainty, the traces of everyday, everywhere chemicals are disrupting cellular development. Now, 
all of us are carrying what, what I, I hate to say it, but, but the truth, it is the truth. What we, we have a company in the Pittsburgh region that's one of the biggest make, makers of bisphenol A. 95% of Americans tested a cap, car, carrying measurable bisphenol in their, uh, A in their urine. It is in everything. We make about 18 billion pounds per year. The problem is it's an estrogen. And we're getting the associations very clearly with all sorts of long-term problems, including, for example, if you expose rats in utero to bisphenol A, of the concentrations that we're carrying in our urine, you end up beginning setting in place the kinds of um, tissue events that lead to prostate cancer and breast cancer in later life. Crystal clear, all right? That's just one of many, many things. Like, and you, you, you cannot escape this compound. It's impossible to escape. Every time you touch a receipt, um, at the supermarket, it's all over your fingers. All right. So they're just the they're horrible surprises. And right now, um, the chemical, the the industries have all the power. This election threw the power totally to the industries. And so yeah, they're going to try to crush, crush endocrine and disruption and research, and they're they're doing it very very aggressively. This is an enormous mistake. But what can you do? Yep. Question here. Uh, I noticed that in the mold uh, reduction or removal, that that gentleman was dressed in a high hazard suit. Yeah. Okay. Why? And going with that, how long does that catalyst persist in the environment? Um, so, both very good questions. He'd be in a high hazard suit regardless. He'd be wearing the high hazard suit if he would. He was in there. Um, the actual active oxidant there is hypochlorite, so the house fills up with chlorine, and he's got he's not meant to be breathing uh, the chlorine. So these guys are in there scrubbing with this stuff, and they're in a fairly heavy chlorine atmosphere if they use it without the catalyst. Um, the catalyst breaks down, but we know exactly how it breaks down and how fast. Um, and what I didn't get to tell you is because of the obsession with endocrine disruptors, We've had to take these chemicals and test them, the, the catalyst, for endocrine effects. And so far, touch wood, no, and we've done a lot, we've done mice studies, we've done fish studies, and we've done a whole lot of cellular studies. So far, no toxic, no, so the, the thing I'm, if a chemical's toxic at a part per billion, a part per trillion, that's a real worry. And that's, so we're focused on the, on the biggest worry, and so far, um, we we have no reason to um, be concerned about uh, catalyst exposures to humans. Not that they're drinking it or anything.